We're in Gray's Inn and we're standing in front of the statue of Sir Francis Bacon, which is very appropriate if we're talking about critical thinking, because he very much emphasised that it's not enough to think logically. We need to think logically about the world. Sir Francis Bacon was very much concerned that we need to use evidence in order to understand the world, and we need to ask questions of that evidence. And this is very much what we would expect the critical thinking student to be doing. We would encourage them to ask questions about claims, whether these are historical claims, whether these are statistical claims. We want students to be asking questions which would be, what is the significance of this evidence? What might it mean? What more do we need to know? And centrally, how might we explain it? Critical thinking works well with everyday examples. Here's one. Five out of the last seven US presidents, including Obama, have been left-handed. This clearly is something which requires explanation, because only about 10% of the US population is left-handed. So how could we explain this? Well, it might well be it's just chance, just coincidence. It's been uh, calculated that there's a one in 1,000 chance of this being coincidence. It could be that uh, the US presidents are drawn from a left-handed group. For example, 40% of American lawyers are left-handed, and most American presidents are lawyers. Critical thinking can best be understood as a set of skills, and these skills can be grouped into three main areas. The first is the analysis of what we would call arguments or lines of inference. And by this, in this we're looking at the way in which reasons are used to support inferences or conclusions. The second general area is evaluation of arguments. And here we're quite simply asking the question, is the argument good or not? Is it weak or strong? And the third general area is production of arguments. And here we're looking at getting students to produce their own arguments, whether these are simple arguments or more complex arguments, whether these are in response to an existing argument or whether they are being asked to create their own. Well, I hate this weather. I just want to make you jump on a plane and go somewhere hot. The hotter, the better. But what about the planet? Your trip to the sun means a gas-guzzling flight. We should be cutting down the air miles. You're such a tree-hugging vegetarian. But what about all the issues with climate change? <sighs> You're so predictable, you don't even drive a car. What we have here is an example of what we would call an ad hominem argument. This means that uh, we have an argument in which the arguer themselves is attacked rather than their argument. So in this example, the argument about air travel is not dealt with. It's the person making the argument that is attacked. Oh, I love being in pubs these days. You don't have to worry about the smoke any longer. If you ban smoking, people just take more soft drugs. Do you reckon? Yeah, and then they'll take more hard drugs. No, no. And then the crime rate will go up. Now, let people smoke if they want to, keep the crime rate down. If they want to kill themselves through smoke, it's up to them, as long as it's not stealing from me. In this example, we have what is called a slippery slope argument. And in such an argument, the person arguing goes too far too quickly. They go from A to B to C to D without spelling out how these things are connected. Another type of argument where there might be problems is what is called a post hoc argument, where just because two things are correlated, it doesn't mean to say that one thing has caused the other. A recent example is that children who watch TV from between one and a half and five hours a day have higher blood pressure than those who don't. Newspapers greeted this with hysteria, telling parents to make sure that their children didn't watch TV. But this clearly is only one explanation of this link. There could be many others. So, we can look at this that TV watching somehow causes higher blood pressure. Could it be that children with higher blood pressure watch more TV? 
Could it be a third factor, such as eating salty snacks whilst they're watching TV, which causes the higher blood pressure? Could it be a number of third factors? Could it be, for instance, that, that watching TV somehow distresses them, the programmes distress them? Could it be that watching too much TV reduces the amount of sleep that they get, all of which might increase blood pressure? Could it be that TV watching and blood pressure cause each other, such that children who watch TV have higher blood pressure, children with higher blood pressure watch more TV? Could it be, quite simply, that the two are related coincidentally? Oh, did you hear about that woman that got attacked in Tuggle Park? Yes, it was terrible. Don't you run there? I do. How can you do that? Especially now, after that's happened. Well, it was unfortunate, but it was also completely out of the ordinary. I've been running in that park for three years, and this is the first incident of its kind. I mean, I, I worry, but I'm not going to give up running just because of some slight chance that I'll be attacked. That's stupid. That woman was really badly beaten up. You know it's going to happen again. Do you think? If you don't stay out of that park, it'll probably happen to you. In this example, we have a case of overgeneralization. The recommendation that one shouldn't run in Tuttle Park is based on one single example of a woman being attacked. Unfortunate though this might be, there is no pattern here. There is nothing that one can generalize from. A single piece of evidence takes us normally nowhere. We want students to develop these critical thinking skills, not just for their own sake, but as something which will apply whatever they're doing, whether it's their history, their biology, their geography. But these critical thinking skills are not just skills that we want students to use in the school. We want them to use them beyond the classroom. We want them to use them whenever they pick up a newspaper and see what claims newspapers are making. We want them to use them when they see advertisements to see, well, is this product that good? Can I believe the evidence? We want students then to use them wherever they are faced with somebody saying, this is the case. So the student says, I'm not sure if it is.